grab a speaking train grid that you can use in your course and see how your learners can kind of benefit and improve their speaking and listening skills, especially their interactive skills um, uh, by the use of speaking frames. And of course, a lot of these speaking frames may or may not be familiar to your learners. Uh, depends on background, what they've grown up with, maybe what they've seen or experienced either at home or community. There's so many different uh, speaking frames available. And of course, we might be more familiar with these kind of terms um, in our classes, you know, even that thing about questions in typical um, tutor learner interaction. Um, it's usually the tutor who asks the question, and perhaps your learner may not have as much experience with asking questions as answering them. Uh, so these will be familiar or unfamiliar to different uh, degrees. And in order to put the whole thing in context here is the triangle, which I think is probably spent on our four years at this point. Uh, the know the learner, know the demand, know what to do. So I'd like to frame this webinar still in terms of the triangle starting from know the learner. As you know from the uh, Teaching Adults to Listen and Speak to Communicate book, there are lots of tools to know the learner. The thing is, we don't have an actual assessment tool. So inside the book there are lots of attitude surveys, um, checklists, and perhaps the uh, request to kind of a lot of observation of your learners, what, what they can and can't do just in the formative assessment. Uh, on page 11 and 12 of this book, it talks about be careful of observations and drawing conclusions um, that, about your learners because they can hold back <laughs> or they can do something which perhaps um, is different from our own context. So, it, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot to think about when we're observing our learner and their uh, speaking and listening interactions. So, <laughs> focusing now on some demands, I can see that I have a lovely little group of about 12 people, I think. So, again, welcome to you all. And each of you will have whole lot of different trainees with a whole lot of different demands. So the demands um, vary. I have actually put this in from Workbase only because it's such a good re resource. Um, Workbase has got some great um, profiles of the demands for all, all kinds of demands, reading, writing, and in this case, speaking and listening demands for different vocations. Here we've got one for carpenters, speaking and listening demands, and it's taken from the Workbase um, website, and in three areas, so occasionally carpenters will need to fill in forms, write notes, and so on, and then they need to talk to carpenters, perhaps listen, respond to instructions, report progress, etc. And then on a regular basis, there are other things like ordering supplies or um, participating in team meetings. The topic I'm going to focus on today is the one in red, and because occasionally carpenters need to discuss problems with a plan or a design with a supervisor or other carpenters, this can actually provide, um, well, some of your trainees might find this easy and others might find it really, really hard. The thing is, what do we know about whether they're going to find this easy or hard? It, it's a tricky one and until we perhaps put them in the situation. So the speaking frame that we'll look at is going to be around, around this particular um, example. But before we do that, we'll look at other demands, like hairdressers' demands for speaking. Again, different demands here. Um, 
my feeling is that perhaps those who choose to go into the hairdressing vocation are probably going to be better naturally speakers and listeners than carpenters. I mean, that could be a big assumption on my part, but um, look, we've got to go from whatever generalisations <laughs> that we can um, think of. So let's have a look at this example. Uh, this is a cut and paste from our interactive listening and speaking progression. And if you have your brown black book, it's on page 57. It's uh, step one, it's responding to and using simple formulaic expressions in spoken language. Now those formulaic expressions could be when perhaps this client comes into the hairdressers and says, um, Hi, I'm here for my haircut, and the hairdresser says, yep, that's lovely to see you, take a seat. Very formulaic, just hi, how are you, I'm fine, that's great. Then step two, we have an example two in the speech bubble, is responding to and using um, skills at managing very simple interactions. Like, Would you like me to dry your hair off a little? Yes, please, very simple interaction and negotiating meaning. So, but will that cost me any more? Is that included in the price? It's included in the price. This is a step up from just a simple formulaic expression. Then we go to the higher, higher step, uh, step three, four straddle of the uh, interactive listening and speaking progression, and much more sophisticated, and definitely a lot more use of vocabulary um, related to context and so the example here is from a tutor talking to his trainee about air filters. So we have vocabulary like clogged, uh, run rough, housing, rectangular housing. By the way, I got this from um, Got this from a nice YouTube, How to Clean Your Air Filter. There's so much on YouTube that you can um, discover or use with your learners. So, you can, uh, okay, go to the next one. And step five, six, the demands are, um, this kind of looks simple, but in fact, the demands are higher because. We have the situation here where the person who is negotiating um, with the IT support person in that speech bubble to perhaps restart the server a bit later than um, 12.30 because it's a webinar happening. There's a lot around that. For example, if you think of a teenager, a teenager may actually, in a natural state, not want to negotiate, they may just want to say, no, I don't want that to happen, and you know, maybe not have those soft skills that allow them to negotiate more professionally um, to change the time. So that whole, um, like, that whole responding and using appropriate speaking and listening skills in, this, in a range of formal and informal settings, there's a lot to that. So, when we're teaching all these demands, and I'm sure you know all your demands of your courses, because <laughs> you will have sat around and thought about them uh, over the months and years, <clears throat> but one way is to use speaking frames. And a speaking frame is a way to sit with your learner or learners and actually identify a particular um, speaking, listening, interaction that they may need in their context and elicit a process they'll need around the speaking frame, maybe even possible scripts. Um, not only a script, but a certain approach or body language or attitude that goes with that may be important. For example, in the, the one we talked about um, in terms of the person who wanted the IT support person to start later, you know, start the server later, then of course the attitude needs to be professional. It can't be demanding. It's like a request rather than a demand. And what does a request look like compared to a demand? Uh, which type will get you what you need uh, in order to negotiate the start time? So that 
that is a very uh, big issue to discuss with your learners. Then there'd be the, a very good chance in a session frame to elicit or, or show or teach or develop the whole sort of vocabulary that would go around the context of whatever uh, session frame is needed. I always put this to link, link whatever you're doing with your trainees to their future vocational pathway because Otherwise, you can tend to get just stuck into, um, in, you tend to get stuck in maybe the, the exercise that you're doing, but um, really important with any of your adult trainees to, to always link whatever you're doing to something meaning, meaningful for them. You will have read while I'm talking the benefits of a speaking frame, but um, let's go and look at one so that we can um, know what we're talking about. Okay. Actually, I always say adapt, 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 but um, whatever you want to teach, whether it be how to ask questions, how to seek clarification, how to um, negotiate some kind of meaning or process, then, you know, this is a, this is a basic one. Um, any kind of interaction, on the left column has a start, a middle, and an end. That's how I put it simply. It's nice to put that simply with your learners as well. And uh, so the main point to remember is that there's always a reason to speak. So let's look at this reason to speak. Very important. Uh, this young man here, he definitely wants to buy a shirt. <laughs> so there is an intrinsic motivation to go to the shop and ask how much is that shirt, can I try on that shirt, and do you have this in a different colour, actually I was thinking of blue, do you have any blue one? So very yeah, he's highly motivated to have this conversation. But what about extrinsic motivation? So, so remember I talked about the carpenter who has who needs to discuss a problem about a plan or design with the supervisor or other carpenters. So go through for a wee process here with my animated slide, so bear with me. And um, here we have our trainee over there. He's doing some job on the job training, um, work experience. There's his tutor on the right hand side. And of course, the extrinsic motivation is the unit standard. He's got to pass the course. Okay. He does have some intrinsic motivation to, to interact with um, this whole process, but um, it's like the learner, perhaps, um, perhaps he doesn't really know what he does, what he doesn't know yet. He doesn't know what kind of um, interactive speaking and listening he needs to do yet. He's up for anything, but um, you know, what happens is that um, he's at work experience and it's a whole new scary environment here. Okay, so he um, he's busy building away and then. Suddenly, he sees something that's a bit of a problem, okay? And he's in a quandary. What does he say? Does he say something? Does he say anything? Does he speak up? Now, the example that, why I've given this example is because it's taken from a real example of a uh, building apprentice who, in fact, was told to put in some tinted glass into this very flash building. And because he was kind of lowest on the on the ladder in rank, and the, um, the boss had left, and there were a whole lot of other builders with him, and, and so on, and they were told to put this glass in, and he was the only one that noticed that the glass was tinted in different colours, and in fact, it was meant to be all the same colour. Now, if you put a large sheet of tinted glass into a building, and it's the wrong colour, you know, it's meant to be there for the next 30 years. Um, well, what do you say? 
if he's the only one who's noticed it. The thing was, he was too shy to actually say, hey, this glass is a different colour. Um, so it turned out that the, gla the wrong glass was put in, and of course there was a huge issue with that. So, you know, how much could that tutor have prepared that trainee um, to speak up? How much could that uh, tutor have prepared the trainee to actually have the conversation? It's kind of tricky. You might think, well, why wouldn't they have said anything? Again, it depends on what they've had modelled from their home, home environment, um, their community, uh, whether they're shy naturally or social naturally. You know, some people wouldn't have had a problem with speaking up. <coughs> we just don't know. So let's look at how this could happen. If we introduce a speaking frame in our classroom for that particular issue, the reason to speak is we want to give a heads up to our trainees about how to speak up if they're out on the job and they see something that they think needs to be, um, to be talked about. So you might elicit, starting from this one uh, with your trainees, well, you know, what's the process? You see an issue with this, um, what would you do? And they might say, well, I might check with the workmates if they agree it's a problem, or do they care? Or Now in this case, I know that the young man had checked with one person, and they said, oh, it doesn't matter, we've just got to do this job, we're told we've got to do it by the end of the day. You know, so in fact, that person didn't care. <coughs> um, you can see where a lot of discussion can come in with your trainees around this process, because the process can be theoretical, or it can be, you know, there's a reality in it as well. If we continue about the process, well, maybe, maybe that person could have asked to talk to the foreman, read the foreman, explain why he's there, describe the issue. You know, is our trainee up for this? It's quite a big ask, actually, and the end of it could be ask if there's anything they need to do, you know, next process, and then thank them. Um, yeah, basically, when I've done this with groups of people, the discussion has been really, really good and very valuable for everyone involved. Now, when we look at the body language or the approach or attitude, um, if they do see this issue, what do they need? What qualities of character? They might, if they're nervous, they need to, be, to call on confidence. What does that confidence look like? Um, how do they kind of, you know, get themselves ready to uh, to talk about this? Um, what exactly do they say as well? Um, he might say something like, Bill, do you have a minute? It's a bit of an issue, I think. Now, it may seem a bit crazy to give these exact scripts, and of course they might not say that exactly, but it does model and give them permission to to speak up. Um, and then, of course, around this whole thing is what does the tutor need to teach? So this is where perhaps vocabulary may need to be taught. Um, it may be that uh, certain formulaic expressions might need to be taught. Uh, yeah, anything around around that you can make some decisions about. Okay. So let's just look at this whole issue here of um, of um, our speaking frames. I've brought this slide up before and Perhaps at this point it would be good to ask you um, to type in some questions and as you type them in then I'll be able to, in about uh, two or three minutes, um, answer some of them. But you can see the benefits of sitting down and actually deciding which conversations that you as a, as a tutor really want to put a stake in the ground about, which ones would really benefit your trainees to know so that they can be a bit empowered in whatever situation that they are, they are put in. Um, 
I think if we go down to that benefit that we're speaking for, and which I didn't cover uh, so much in the first round, it's this whole idea of you're able to model these, these uh, speaking processes. And in fact, around this, you could even role play um, in the classroom. You could play some YouTube clips about it. You could show some, um, you know, find some video clips on it as well so that they can see people doing it. Anything that develops their confidence and the part about encouraging clarity of expression is probably very closely linked to um, giving them a chance to practice using those specialised words or jargon or uh, special names of um, different equipment. Um, it, um, it just helps provide a nice you know, context for the learners to understand, you know, in the classroom setting, what it might be like when they're going out into the workplace or um, into the workshop or, or so on, just to get them to yeah, feel good, good and confident about going out. And um, the other part here is modelling appropriate use of language and register because young people perhaps only are used to one or two different kinds of registers. And again, it depends on you know, what they've experienced before, what they've seen modelled. But um, this role play and perhaps using, you know, practicing using polite or uh, direct or you know, confident or so on examples um, in tone, then they're going to feel Sort of happier about using it in, in real in real life too. So we have our reason to speak as summary um, as the main thing. Um, you need perhaps to ask yourself, you know, I suppose it's linked with the demand, um, and really think about what speaking frames that your learners need for your course and what they look like. <coughs> Notice there that this might be a good chance too when you're talking, when you're introducing this to your learners, to ask them what they're already familiar with. Because if they're already familiar with something like um, perhaps introducing, then if they've done that once, then they could do it again in another way. So find out what speaking interaction that your learners can already do really well. And like they can perhaps give you some um, examples of that. Uh, some of your learners may have uh, be very proficient at um, perhaps looking at their pepeha, um, where they're introducing themselves according to their, uh, where they come from. So if they can do that in one area of their life, then they can transfer that uh, strength or skill over to another area where maybe they're introducing themselves to their workmates or employer or um, in their, uh, to their tutor in some way. Um, and this one here, thinking about these, uh, some of them are much easier than others and uh, things like peaceful negotiations, uh, resolving conflict, showing assertiveness, really quite tricky and there are lots of models that can be used for um, from different books uh, on how to do this that I'm sure you're quite familiar with. Uh, I, I added one here about thanking peers, tutors and admin staff. I think that's an interesting one because I notice as I've been teaching for many years that some groups of learners thank the tutor at the end of class, um, some don't. It depends on the expectation. But when we're sending our learners out, for example, to workplace experience or to, you know, it's really important to think about what speaking and um, listening interactions will really benefit them. And I know that um, the ability to see something that's been done well and say thank you and acknowledge the person who's given them that, that um, you know, skill, is, uh, it, it could stand for your learners in good stead. Uh, they could perhaps, um, I don't know, it's just like getting, cracking open 
their world so that um, they can interact with it in a way that really works for them and strengthens them and empowers them.